Welcome mystery enthusiasts. In the shadowy corners of our justice system, there exist stories so perplexing, so inexplicable, that they will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew. Get ready for an exploration of wrongful convictions and the quest for exoneration. Number 3. Lena Baker. Imagine, if you will, the small town of Cuthbert, Georgia, in the 1940s, where the echoes of civil rights struggles resounded in every corner. It was a time when racial segregation and discrimination were rampant, and the dark secrets of injustice lurked beneath the surface. It was within this context that the mystery of Lena Baker unfolded. Lena Baker, an African-American maid, was born into a family of sharecroppers in 1900. Her life was a continuous struggle, working as a farm laborer in her youth and later as a maid, all in an effort to support her family. By the 1940s, she was a mother of three children, striving to make ends meet. The plot thickens when Lena began working for Ernest Knight, an older white man with a grist mill. But what seemed like a simple employment soon took a sinister turn. Knight, who had already sexually assaulted Lena multiple times, held her as if she were a prisoner, a modern-day form of slavery. The townspeople and Knight's son were vehemently against their relationship, making Lena's life even more miserable. Threats loomed on the horizon. The climax of this enigmatic story arrived on the fateful night when a heated argument broke out between Lena and Knight. In the midst of the chaos, Knight menacingly brandished an iron bar, and Lena found herself locked in a life-and-death struggle. As the struggle reached its zenith, Lena, fearing for her life, made a drastic decision. In the aftermath of that event, Lena Baker reported the incident, claiming self-defense. The trial that followed was filled with tension and uncertainty. She testified, detailing the horrors she had endured and the threats that forced her hand. However, an all-white all-male jury swiftly rejected her self-defense plea and handed down a conviction of capital murder. In an era where racial segregation and discrimination were the norm, where black citizens had been disenfranchised for years, Lena's fate was sealed. Despite legal challenges and her own court-appointed counsel dropping her as a client, Lena's path seemed unalterable. Governor Ellis Arnold offered a brief respite, allowing time for the Board of Pardons and Parole to review her case. However, Lena's plea for clemency was denied. She was transferred to the Georgia State Prison at Reedsville, awaiting the inevitable. As the clock ticked down to her execution date, Lena Baker's last words echoed her unshakable belief in her actions. What I'd done, I did in self-defense, or I would have been killed myself. Where I was, I could not overcome it. God has forgiven me. I have nothing against anyone. I am ready to go. I am ready to meet my God. I have a very strong conscience. The conclusion to Lena Baker's story is a surprising twist in this enduring mystery. Decades after her execution in 1945, in 2005, the state of Georgia finally granted Lena Baker a full and unconditional pardon, recognizing the injustice that had befallen her. The Lena Baker enigma serves as a poignant reminder of the injustices of the past where the relentless pursuit of truth can unearth the most unexpected resolutions, even in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds. Number 2. Daryl Hunt. Picture a quiet night in Winston-Salem, North Carolina in 1984, with the city shrouded in darkness and an eerie sense of mystery looming in the air. Little did anyone know that this seemingly uneventful night would soon give rise to a tale of injustice that would confound the minds of many. The story commences with a disturbing event, the tragic murder of Deborah Sykes, a young newspaper copy editor. She was brutally attacked on her way to work one fateful morning. The crime itself was described as an unusually vicious rape and murder, marking it as a deeply unsettling case. During the investigation, a witness came forward, pointing fingers at Daryl Hunt and his friend, Sammy Mitchell, placing them near the scene of the crime. This led to a series of events that would forever alter their lives. Hunt was arrested and his arrest photo was even published in the newspaper, making him synonymous with the heinous murder. The subsequent trial was a tense and emotionally charged affair, ultimately leading to Hunt's conviction for first-degree murder in 1985, despite a lack of solid physical evidence connecting him to the crime. 
his conviction was rendered by a mostly white jury. Hunt's life took another dark turn when he faced a retrial in 1990 and was once again found guilty of the same crime. It appeared as though he was destined to spend the rest of his days behind bars for a crime he asserted he did not commit. The turning point in this enigmatic story emerged with advancements in forensic testing, including DNA analysis. In 1994, Hunt's DNA was subjected to testing, and astonishingly, it did not match the DNA found at the crime scene. The revelation should have led to his immediate release, but the prosecution held on to the notion that Hunt might have still been involved in the murder, casting a long shadow of doubt over his case. As the years passed, Hunt supporters tirelessly worked to unveil the truth. They believed that if the rape charge against Hunt was debunked, it would cast a long shadow of doubt over his murder charges as well. Then, in 2003, a breakthrough occurred. The DNA that was collected from the scene was run against a state database, leading to a match with the DNA of Willard E. Brown, who confessed to the rape and murder of Deborah Sykes. This revelation marked the shocking twist in the tale, exonerating Daryl Hunt and securing his release in 2004. The story of Daryl Hunt is a harrowing account of the justice system's potential for error and the devastating impact it can have on innocent lives. Before we visit our last story, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more. Number 1. The Central Park Five On a fateful April night in 1989, Central Park in Manhattan, New York, turned into a battleground of crime and mystery. The dark and sprawling park became the backdrop for a series of shocking events that would forever change the lives of those involved. It all began when a group of teenagers from East Harlem, numbering around 20 to 32, entered Central Park, leaving behind a trail of chaos. Reports of muggings, assaults, and robberies started flooding in, as darkness settled over the city. The assailants rampaged through the park, attacking bicyclists, hurling rocks at innocent bystanders, and robbing those who crossed their path. The night took a darker turn as a group of teenagers descended further into the park, crossing paths with four male joggers. What happened next was the beginning of a mystery that would grip the nation. Patricia, Trisha, Ellen Maley, a 29-year-old woman, was out for her regular run. But her routine jog through Central Park would lead her into a nightmare. She was violently assaulted, and her injuries were beyond imagination. The brutality of the attack was unparalleled, leaving her in a coma for nearly two weeks. But the mystery didn't stop there. Patricia Maley wasn't identified for almost 24 hours, and the police struggled to piece together the events of that horrifying night. In the following days, law enforcement scrambled to make sense of the chaos. Up to 12 youths were believed to be involved, and the case quickly became a symbol of violence, lawlessness, and terror in the heart of New York City. Police apprehended a number of suspects, but five teenagers, Antron McRae, Kevin Richardson, Youssef Salam, Raymond Santana, Corey Wise, were indicted for their involvement in Maley's assault. Initially there was one more teenager, Stephen Lopez, but charges against him were dropped after he pleaded guilty to a different assault. These teenagers, later known as the Central Park Five, faced a long and uncertain road ahead. What followed were videotaped confessions by some of the accused, filled with discrepancies, inconsistencies, and questions about the events that night. Their confessions implicated them as accomplices in the brutal assault, but the mystery remained, did they truly commit the crime? A decade later, while incarcerated for assaulting other women in 1989, a serial rapist named Matias Reyes came forward, confessing to the Maley assault and claiming sole responsibility. This revelation, backed by DNA evidence, shook the foundation of the case. The convictions of McRae, Richardson, Salam, Santana, and Wise were eventually vacated in 2002, marking a turning point in the Central Park Jogger case. But the mystery surrounding that dreadful night and the true nature of their involvement lingered. The story of the Central Park Jogger case isn't just about the shocking attack but also about the enduring mystery of what truly transpired that night, concealed for over a decade. And as for Steven Lopez, whose conviction was overturned in 2022, his story adds another layer to this complex tale of justice, innocence, 
and the relentless pursuit of the truth. We hope you found these stories interesting and thought-provoking. We encourage you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Keep being curious and thanks for watching.